So we're going to start off by recalling two formulas that we did last time. Okay, so the secant line is right here, and the slope of the secant is the difference in the y values over the difference in the x values, which is x naught plus h minus x naught, which just is h. So you take the limit as h goes to 0, and basically the secant line approaches the tangent line. So a quick example. We want to find the slope of the tangent line of f of x equals x squared plus 1 at these three points. So we're going to start with x naught equals 3. So at x naught equals 3, we want the slope of the tangent at that point is the limit. x naught is 3, so we place 3 there and there. Plug it in. So f of 3 plus h, we place x with 3 plus h, so it's 3 plus h quantity squared, and then plus 1. Minus f of 3, plugging 3 into that function right there, 3 squared plus 1. Clean it up. 3h and 3h is 6h. I'm going to factor out an h. As h goes to 0, this approaches 6 plus 0, which is just plain old 6. Now we can do this two more times, but instead of doing this three times, we're going to go ahead and let's just use an arbitrary point, a variable. Let me write that out. So instead of x naught, x naught usually means it's a constant that you're going to plug in. We're going to use our variable x in that function, in the, in the same formula. So that means our slope, at a, our slope of the tangent line, it's x plus h. And so let's go ahead and do that with our function. Our function, the same function, just write it there for you so we can see it. So x plus h is quantity x plus h squared plus 1 minus the whole function. Work it out. I really think it's important that you make sure you foil this out and you have a middle term. A lot of people are forgetting this, especially if they're not seeing algebra for a very long time. And I have an h in common. I'll factor it out so it'll cancel with that bottom one. Again, we plug in h equals 0 now, and then we get 2x. So we did get, we plugged in a variable point, so therefore we get a variable answer. And the reason is very simple. The tangent line at every single different point is different, so it's a variable slope. Let's draw out what that means. Write that out. That's variable slope. And this function... So at the point that we did up there... We had our slope at x equals 3 is 6. So if we go to at x equals 3, we draw a little tangent line there. Eh, it's a little bit steeper than that. And that slope is 6. That's what we found in the previous problem. So at x not equals 3, we get m tam, m tam equals 2x, which is that's what we got above. Let's do the other two now. And let's draw it over here at 0. Oh, yeah. The slope is 0. At negative 2, again, it's not as steep as 3. And it's going backwards. It's decreasing. And so the slope is negative, And we can see it's negative. And again, if we want to do other slopes at 2, that's m equals 4, 2 times 2. So m equals 0. So at 1, m equals 1. At negative 1, we can see it's the same but going the opposite direction. Negative 1, and so forth. New definition here. It's the derivative definition. Okay, quick question. Why do you think it's called the derivative? 
Yeah, because the derivative is derived from the function. It's derived, it's the derivative. Very clever, huh? <laughs> so I just want to um, go back to our last example and give it a little bit better notation than we just used instead of M10. Well, basically, the last problem, we had our function. We found our derivative to be 2x using the formula. The slope of the tangent line using the limit formula as h goes to zero. And we got f prime of three, we got six. We just plugged it in there. f prime of zero is zero. And f prime of negative two was negative four. And again, we worked all this out and it's the same problem, but now we have a little bit better notation. This is this, nice and compact. I want to write out all the different interpretations that we learned from yesterday about the slope of the tangent line and the slope of the secant line. So our first interpretation, so it's a derivative at a point. So if the derivative at a point exists as a real number, not an infinity, then f is differentiable at that point. So the derivative at a point means a lot of things that we've learned so far. It's the slope of the tangent line at the function at x naught. We drew that out right here. It's the slope of the tangent line at that point. If the derivative at that point exists as a real number, f is differentiable at x naught. It's got to exist. That limit's got to exist. The derivative at a point is also called the instantaneous velocities. Remember, the slope of the tangent line was the instantaneous velocity. Without taking the limit, that's the average velocity. And another name, instead of velocity, another, we could just call it in general, the rate of change of f of x naught. And that brings us to this definition. So again, this is pretty much the same thing here. If it exists as a real number, so if the derivative, which is equal to the limit, if this limit exists, the function's differentiable at that point. This next list is really helpful sometimes. If we know what the graph looks like, we can tell we have differentiability problems by the graph. So basically, it's not differentiable at corners or cusps. So for example, that would be a corner. The absolute value, for example, has a corner. We have this slope going this way, and then maybe going this way. That's a cusp. So this one's a little bit harder to see. But a vertical tangent line would be like x to the one-third, be the inverse of x to the third. We have kind of like a half a parabola that way, but then it switches. It wouldn't be that way, it would, because then it wouldn't be a function. But it's kind of the same thing, and then it switches like that. And this is our tangent line at that point. It's a vertical tangent line. So again, it's not differentiable. It's continuous, but not differentiable because that limit doesn't exist. The value at that point at the derivative doesn't exist. And last but not least, but one of the easier ones, points of discontinuity. So basically, if it's not continuous, then not differentiable. The other way around is true. If it's differentiable, then it's gonna be continuous, okay? Let's go ahead and write that as a note. Okay, let's do our first example. So here we're gonna show the absolute value is not differentiable at x equals zero. And as I mentioned, I already gave this as an example. The graph is this, it's a corner. We wanna show it, okay, algebraically. We have to use the definition. So we'll have to write this out as x by the definition of absolute value and minus x if x is less than zero. So that's our definition of absolute value we've seen several times already in the last chapter. So the derivative of at a point 
So f of 0 plus h at x equals 0 is the point in question. Just f of h, which is the absolute value. It's the limit still. f of 0. And this, because it involves the absolute value, which is a piecewise function, and we want to know what this limit is as h approaches 0, we need to do the left limit and the right limit. I'll do the right one first because it's easier. So h gets replaced with, to the right of 0, it's positive. So we just drop it, which is 1. It's the limit of 1, which is 1. Limit of a constant is constant. Left limit. So to the left of 0, we have negatives. So that means absolute value of h. We're looking to at negative values, so it's going to be minus h. So the left limit does not equal to the right limit. Limit does not exist. Therefore, f is not differentiable. That's the end of that problem. I want us to write out all the notations for derivative. That's going to be really important to know how to write the derivatives. So more than just the notation that I showed. And trust me, you want to know all of them as you progress, especially if you need to go all the way to differential equations. You need to know all these different notations and know how to use them. So the derivative, well, let me write it out in words. So our first one that we've seen so far is f prime of x. That's equal to the derivative of f of x in terms of x, or we call it d dx of f of x. So that's equal to f prime of x. Now also remember the same notation, d dx, instead of f of x, it can equal to y. Remember y is equal to f of x, so all I've done is replace this f of x with y. And then this is helpful, a little bit helpful to remember. So now, the, another notation is that y can actually be, the parentheses can be dropped, and it can be popped up here, dy dx, okay? So don't get these confused. dy dx is the derivative of y in terms of x, the derivative of y in terms of x, the derivative of f of x in terms of x, f prime of x is the derivative of f in terms of x. And there's one last one. I don't think I use it very often in this class, but I have used it in differential equations. The last one. Oh, and there's one more. <laughs> and I think it's most people's favorite, but again, I caution you of using only one notation. Y prime. This is F prime, Y prime. So again, the two most common are Y prime equals F prime of X. But dy dx is very common to use. I like this. So if I have y equals f of x, if we have our function, and I want to take the derivative of both sides, I like to show that it's in terms of x. It's very helpful. We take the derivative of the left side, the derivative of the right side, and we get, again, d dx of y is dy dx prime of x just to show you how it works a little bit. Now, derivative at a point. So that would be f prime at x naught. Again, we can do d dx, the derivative of f of x, evaluated at x equals x naught. Or we can do dy dx, which is the deriv derivative of y in terms of x, evaluated at x equals x naught. Again, the function. It's the derivative evaluated at x naught. Okay, so these are all three the same thing. If we want to change the variable, we can. Like, for example, you have a function in terms of u. Then we can take y prime equals g prime of u. We would take d du of the left side, d du of the right side. And this could be dy du. It can be in terms of t. It can be any independent variable. And one last notation, delta. 
It was called delta, like a little triangle. Means increment or change. So for example, our m secant is the change in y all over the change in x. It's our slope. Our m tan is the limit as the bottom goes to zero. So a little bit shorthand notation. We'll be seeing that notation throughout the book. One last example. Okay, and then we're going to sketch it just to make sure we're understanding this. Looks like if we remember from the limits, it's two radicals, two terms. So we're going to multiply by the conjugate, top and bottom, wrap it, we'll foil it. That square root will come out because you have two of them. Your two don't, since it's the conjugate, your two middle terms are going to cancel. And then your minus square root of x squared. I guess I can write it. I can not be. I can. So, so we're going to foil it. The middle terms always cancel on a conjugate. And the first two, the square is going to cancel with the square root. Okay, don't leave out your bottom term there. So those cancel. Now we can plug in h, because then we'll, we won't have 0 over 0 anymore. So we're going to plug in h equals 0. So all that work. And then we want to find, plug it in. And then I said sketch it real quick, and I just meant the function. The function was so at one, two, three, four, flattening out. Can I have? It's not rising very much because it's one fourth. There you have it. Okay, thanks for watching.